Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We're going to kick off with our next session, um, and I'm going to invite up Kathleen to give you a little rundown of what that session is and um, introduce our speakers. Kathleen, please go ahead and turn your camera on. Thanks, Caroline. Yes, so you heard now from the investor perspective, and this panel is focusing more on those that have already run through the hoops of trying to attract investors. Uh, and leading the panel today is going to be uh, John Shepard, who is from GDI. And GDI is a nonprofit that's been collaborating with IBI over the past few months about some potential joint ventures in terms of how they could help uh, the industry to scale in collaboration with uh, IBI. So more news on that front in, in the coming year. But John, if you want to turn on your camera and mic. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, pleasure to pleasure to be here. I'm on a uh, a stormy part of uh, the coast in 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 southern England. As um, Kathleen said, I work for an organisation called GDI, the Global uh, Development Incubator, and we, um, we 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 look for interesting combinations of uh, entrepreneurs and funding and ideas that we think can make a a big difference in terms of social or environmental impact. Um, I lead on climate for GDI, and I've been very interested in the biochar space for a year or so now. So I know you know rather less about it than probably everybody else on the call, but if um, um, I've spent a lot of uh, a lot of time over the last 12 months uh, talking to people and reading up on the subject. Uh, before that, I worked for uh, EY, the the global uh, professional services firm, and I ran a non-profit part of EY's business that um, focused on social entrepreneurs, uh, helping them scale their businesses across a whole range of sectors. Uh, so off grid, off grid energy affordable education, healthcare, financial inclusion. So I've had the privilege of working with some uh, some really extraordinary impact minded entrepreneurs um, around the world. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. As Kathleen said, um, this panel is, is about start biochar startups perspectives on investors as opposed to investors perspectives on on biochar businesses and clearly there will be you know some some overlap and, and some common themes but we thought it might be interesting to do it from the from kind of from the other way around um in terms of the uh the running order we've got um we've got i think four panelists i'm not sure whether we found uh whether we found daniel yet but uh we got brian we've got hands we got mike um and then we've got daniel uh who is standing in for his colleague um alison dring we've got three of them as ceos and hands who i i know was on the previous panel uh is an investor and a fundraiser for um a, a particular uh, biochar business they can introduce themselves but we've got a we've got a really great lineup of people so i thought what we could do is, is hear from each of them um for a few minutes on their thoughts of um and their experiences and no doubt the scars on their backs um as as entrepreneurs looking for investment in, in the biochar space um and then we can have a little bit of um back and forth um and then bring in uh questions from uh the audience and uh, caroline I'm, I'm sure you can help moderate the questions or or they'll appear in the chat so um why don't we get going and what i'd ask each of the panelists to do is um is introduce themselves and then just give us their thoughts on on this topic of um uh of, of, of startups perspectives on uh, on looking for investments um and in terms of running order um can we go brian and then daniel and then hans and then mike um and if we haven't got daniel yet then let's go brian to to hans but brian do you want to uh, kick us off I think I'm on, right? You are. All right, good. <laughs> uh, and so now I get to share my screen and hopefully everyone can see the screen. Can you see that everyone? Good, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that as a positive. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the company Glanris and then kind of how we got to where we are. Um, <clears throat> we are a, uh, slightly different uh, company than a lot of what you've seen already. Uh, we've created a water filtration media um, that turns an ag waste product, in our case, rice husks, uh, into a very high performing dual function water media that we call biocarbon. 
So, you know, why rice husks? Well, um, rice is uh, actually pretty special because the husks have some unique chemistry. Uh, they're very high in silica, um, which we're able to build some um, unique chemistry on top of uh, during an activation process that allows us to be able to remove dissolved metals. Um, so everybody's heard about the role that activated carbon uh, plays in removing organics from water. Well, now we can remove organics as well as dissolved metals like lead, chromium, et cetera, all the bad stuff. And the other thing, you know, about why, why rice husks is that rice is very plentiful. It turns out that it's, uh, you know, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, um, ag waste uh, products in the world, about 220 billion pounds of rice husks are generated uh, every year. And, you know, when we start talking about applications, we're not really focused on uh, soil amendment. Again, we're focused on uh, producing this material for water filtration. So when you take a look at how our media compares to the stuff on the market today, well, we do what activated carbon does but the, the product that you see used a lot, if you've got a Brita filter or any one of these other pitcher-based systems and you're able to actually look inside that uh, cartridge, what you'd see is about 60% of that is an ion exchange resin bead, which is a, a petroleum-based microplastic product, which is what they use today to remove metals. We can eliminate the use of microplastics with a completely green product that, and here's the best part, we're a tenth of the cost of those materials. So pretty attractive from that standpoint. So wh where are we? Well, we, we just uh, this year closed a seed round um, of about $3 million. Uh, we, you know, how did we find those, uh, those people? Well, um, you know, we, we started as you should always start, which is locally. <laughs> Because the people that that know you, the people that are um, you know in your area, are the ones that uh, will be most supportive of any economic development project uh, in your region. Um, but we also reached out to uh, an ag tech fund um, and to a very large uh, family office, We've got about a billion five um, to uh, to to invest in. That was very interested in. Uh, circular economy uh, products uh, and and companies, and we're getting ready to uh, to do uh, a raise uh, starting early next year, which will be a five to eight million dollar raise, which will be our our Series A, um, and we're going after the water, climate tech, impact investors, um, you know, et, et cetera. And, you know, the, as we just heard on some of these last uh, uh, sessions, when we're looking at the value of our product out there versus the, the price to produce, I mean, what we're really talking to some of these people about is stressing that, that the water applications and the chemistry that we've got there and the patents that we've got uh, on, on all of that are what allow us to sell our biocarbon not for $200 to $500 a ton, but for $8,000 a ton. And that's less expensive than what's on the market today. Um, and, and that's the real driver for, for us. You know, in terms of overall funding issues, as we're starting to talk to investors right now, um, you know, what, what I'm seeing is, you know, there's some, there's some really great positives out there that are driving interest. I mean, this time around, as we start talking, um, and, and because of some of the press that we've gotten uh, in, in the marketplace, we're getting people uh, calling us uh, saying that they're interested in talking to us about our, our, our next raise, which is always a great position to, to be in. But because the carbon credit market is growing and there's a lot of attention being placed upon that, I think it's getting a lot of people looking at how um, you know, how, how biochar uh, can be used to address uh, climate tech uh, issues. And, and this sequestration model, um, and, and even, you know, not even to the numbers that we've just heard about in the last session, 
but you know even if we're looking at the you know five to to, to ten uh, tons per ton uh, of sequestered biochar, there's interest in this because people see, as IPCC report says, that you know this is one of the major potential tools that we have uh, in addressing climate change. Um, you know the the negatives, and again, this was talked about last time. Um, most venture capitalists um, like to follow a model where they see a big win with some big company, and then they can come in and sort of follow that model um, with the next wave, uh, next iteration of product. There are no big wins so far in the production uh, of, of biochar. It's there are a lot of mom and pop players out there. Um, there's really not to scale yet. Um, there's not some of the companies or teams or even applications that can get to that kind of scale. Um, and, and I think there's, there's some concern about whether soil amendment market alone uh, without some you know, other uh, additives to it, whether it's government subsidies or um, some of these other carbon credits, um, you know, it's, uh, there, there's concern about whether that market is really big enough um, and the dollars are there and the numbers really work. Um, and I think the other negative is, um, you know, and it's, it seems very counterintuitive, um, but it's, it's hard these days to raise a million dollars. Um, it's a lot easier to raise 10 to $15 million. Um, the funds that are there looking at that sort of next level as you, you know, cross that chasm and that, you know, valley of death there, it gets easier to raise the money as you get bigger. But the problem is to get started in this world, it's really hard to find that because there aren't a lot of funds specific to the market that we're in right now. So um, that's my uh, quick uh, five minute uh, plus overview. And um, uh, obviously if you've got any questions, we'll be around later. Brian, thanks. That's um, that's great. That's uh, that that that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, eight eight thousand dollars a ton is a is a very eye catching number. Um, Daniel, I understand that you're you're with us. So thanks for um, thanks for standing in for Alison and uh, and joining us. Good to see you. Um, could you um, just just give us a quick introduction to yourself? Then it'd be great to um, to hear a bit more about your organisation, a bit more about your um, your thoughts on the topic of the panel. Thanks. Now your um, mic is is off. Can you just turn that on? Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Daniel Schwach. Hi, everyone. I'm co-founder and CTO of Made of Air. Um, we're a carbon negatives materials company uh, making essentially materials based on biochar. We're located in Berlin. Um, and I'll share my screen with you now. Can you see that? Yeah. All right. Mm. Caroline, I'm, a, I'm telling you to advance to the next slides. Is that what we're doing? Uh, no, you should be able to advance your own slides. Oh, okay. All mm -hmm. right. It's not working. I can uh, pull your slides up. That, just it just that? seems like if I, if I do it, I can't see myself. It's a bit strange. Oh, then go ahead and just unshare your screen and I'll just share mine. Uh, and you'll just tell me next slide. Mm -hmm. Make sure to click, click the share button again to, to close down your share screen so I can share mine. All right. Thanks. Great. So yeah, we're made of air. That was the intro I gave already. So we can advance to the next slide. 
So um, the reason we're here today is because uh, we raised um, a seed round earlier this year, um, 5.8 million, um, uh, with, with a kind of interesting group of investors. Um, from our perspective, we saw a lot of interest from investors during the fundraise in the topic of biochar, but also a lot of like sort of, um, yeah, a lot of uh, lack of understanding of the business and just sort of like a, uh, a lot of interest, but ultimately not that many uh, investments. Uh, next slide. This is our, our group of investors that we found in the end. So I think uh, also just again to, uh, to emphasize that we were looking for uh, VCs here, uh, a particular kind of investor. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, just going over these, so our lead investor was TDV and it's a, it's a, a fund from Norway focusing uh, on sustainable investments. And we're also able to get some uh, players from the built environment, EQT Foundation, one of the biggest uh, real estate portfolio holders um, in the world, I believe. And then also some uh, VC from California, this Tuesday Capital, and then some uh, individual investors with Patrick Pichette, former C CFO of Google, and Axel Dunsvindal. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with him, but he's a Olympic, I think two times Olympic champion skier also from Norway. Next slide. So as I, as I said, our experience uh, talking to these VCs was that we could tell there was a lot of interest, but the VCs were really trying to come, were struggling to come to terms with what biochar is and how you can build a business out of it. Um, so We've, we had a lot of discussions about what differentiates us from a standard biochar business model. Um, I think the, the standard model was very hard to grasp for them, um, especially because it was hard for them to see how you can scale. So there were a lot of questions about um, how to secure sufficient feedstock, um, but also like trying to find out if you were ambitious enough in your um, in your um, plans and your targets. Uh, so, and that was both in terms of your eco impact. So the large funds like uh, Breakthrough Energy Venture, et cetera, they always uh, are pushing you towards very, very large narratives um, and asking basically how you can get to a half uh, gigaton scale per year in a certain amount of time, et cetera. And then the other thing is I think that was a bit at odds with the VC community is that biochar is, or, or the roots of biochar are really uh, agri agricultural. So uh, sometimes there were some cultural difficulties of uh, conveying the benefits um, to, to the analysts of the VCs that are used to working in a very high tech environment. So there were a lot of discussions around stoichiometric analyses. So like a very strong, uh, a desire for very strong let's say theoretical foundation for the assumptions around the LCA that maybe in, in the biochar community, many people take for granted, like these, these basic calculations, 3.7 tons of CO2 per, per ton of carbon and largely recuperating the energy and the char and how you arrive at this kind of negative uh, carbon emission claim um, was, um, by many investors not readily accepted without a lot of um, proof. Um, and then also relating back to the scaling question, it was often just about like, how can you have multiple value propos propositions on this one product? Uh, so talking about double, triple, double and triple bottom lines. Uh, next slide. So this is really what we're doing. We're taking biochar, we're running it through a series of uh, refinery steps, making granulates, then products, and then we're also spending a lot of time in our narrative about the end of life, so talking about how to retire the products after their use. Um, just adding there that we're mostly focused on long-term applications, not sort of throwaway plastics, et cetera, but mostly built environment and high-value products. 
next slide. And so what we were always fascinated in this biochar process and what we spent a lot of time thinking about is how to really connect it to scale. And I think that's what helped us talking to the VCs. Um, and that was this grand narrative of basically saying, like really thinking of a, of a cycle in a way, of a carbon cycle, but one that's about 350 gigatons, uh, 350 million years in scope. Um, so starting from the time that the carbon was created to the industrialization, and then now with this prospect of using our customers' supply chains um, as carbon sinks. Next slide. And so we're really spending a lot of time honing our messaging uh, to our brand customers. We, we ourselves are trying to build a brand that I think Tom Castine mentioned that, that the, um, the, the complexity is so hard to convey to consumers. So for us, it's becoming very important to pack this value proposition in a recognizable brand. And this is sort of just uh, one example of what we're doing. Next slide. And so with this, these pitches and, and this kind of language, we've been able to secure pilots with leading brands. Next slide. Culminating in our pilot with Audi for their renewable dealership. And uh, here's maybe just a hint also of this like double, triple bottom line is that we're providing a carbon negative product, um, which offers the same per performance. Uh, as a traditional material at the same cost, but with a, uh, an, a vastly improved carbon balance. And uh, what we're advertising here is on the one hand, the negative emissions of our product, but then also the avoided emissions of the conventional product. So in this case, it would be negative two tons for our material per ton and uh, 11 tons of carbon for the aluminum alternative, which would result in a 13 ton benefit. Next slide. And then just um, what we got as a lot of feedback from the investors that did invest in us in the end and others as well that were close to investing was uh, that uh, the balance team that we had in their eyes played a key role. So um, having business development, technology and uh, leadership in general. Next slide. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, D D Daniel, that was fascinating. Um, it really was. Are, are you able to say a little bit more about your um, market projections? Obviously, not asking you to uh, break any um, commercial, uh, anything that's commercially confidential, but uh, it's such an interesting business model that you've got and such extraordinary materials that you're working on. What are the sort of market projections that you, you're thinking in terms of? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, those are the limitations of me stepping in as a CTO. I don't have that as present as maybe Allison would have, but we're basically tied to the existing materials. So if we're looking at the plastics industry, I think that's about 350 million tons of plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, about 30% of that is in durable applications. And that's kind of what we're going for. So um, maybe from the other perspective, the pilot plant we're building right now um, is at a capacity of about 700 tons of material. And um, yeah, and then with the next uh, funding round, we're, we're basically planning a factory that's about six times that size. And, and I guess if, if your business model is to displace existing materials, and I, I'm sure that people will pay a premium for you know the the the, the carbon negative um, aspects of this, and frankly, just the the cool factor of, um, of of what you're doing. But that only goes so far, right? There's only so much of a premium people are prepared to to, to pay. Um, so, what are you finding in terms of of your price point in the in in the market? Are you at the scale yet where you can price this uh, price your materials competitively? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to say in general because we're replacing a lot of different materials. In some cases, we are at price parity. In some cases, we can compete already. In others, we're more expensive. Um, but if you start taking in all these other benefits, like avoided taxes or carbon credits, um, the projected scarcity of fossil products, um, then you can quickly buy, build 
business models with your customers and at least work with them in identifying at what time horizon you will reach the break even point with these materials. And there is still, because it is really like a new topic, I think there's a lot of openness because the customers recognize that something is coming at them that's very big and very disruptive for their existing business models. So um, I think building, kind of like building these business cases with your customers, that's um, working quite well with us. And that is a very complex task because you have to understand all these different elements. You have to understand the price developments of your competitor, competitor products. You have to understand the carbon markets developing, uh, the taxes, et cetera. Um, so, but, but we're, I think we have a pretty good way of doing that right now. And that's why we're able to, to partner with a lot of these brands. Great. Well, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot more about Made of Air. Absolutely fascinating. Daniel, thank you. Can you turn off your um, camera and mic for now? Um, and we can, sure. we can bring you back in for questions. Thank you. Um, so looking at the uh, the Q&A panel, uh, there's some great uh, questions coming in. Please, please do keep them coming because when, when we've heard from all the speakers, we'll, uh, we'll start picking questions off those, um, off that panel. So, um, yeah, put put your put your questions in. Vote for other people's questions, and we'll we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, time now to hear from Hans. Um, Hans, I um, I hope you haven't got a sore throat from um, all the talking that you've been doing this afternoon. But it's been uh, fascinating to listen to you so far. It'd be great to hear your perspective from sort of kind of the opposite side from the uh, uh, from the panel you were talking on previously. So um, over to you. Thanks. Nope, that was wrong. That was right. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks uh, for having me once again on, on this panel. Uh, really glad to be here and uh, sharing a bit of the journey of a kind of classical biochar company um, and, and the story of how we grew the business, how we grow the business and how we found um, the right investor. So what is Carbuna? Carbuna is a, a biochar company where we're mixing biochar with organic and uh, liquid nutrients and with microorganisms and or microorganisms but we're also trading biochar untreated biochar and we have um, uh, different fractions and um, we can provide kind of any biochar you want and if tomorrow somebody comes and says i want to have biochar mixed with coca-cola we're there and if someone wants uh, one bag uh, once in his life he will get it and if uh, he wants one truck uh, a day or a week i mean a day is not yet there but a week um, we can do that and so don't want to go too deep into that um, we're mainly focusing today or we started focusing on livestock and agriculture and um, now more and more urban applications, but also kind of looking into supplying into industry and, um, and construction uh, materials as well as a supplier of biochar. And I mean, the, the key value proposition is that we are really quality focused. That means uh, we, we know exactly how to run through certifications and we, we follow the quality rules and um, this is also from my solo background, very important. If you want to grow a business, quality and um, implementing the right processes is, is really key. Now, so we grew that business quite nicely um, over, um, over the last years. We've kind of established quite a good strategic position and um, the products are, are, are certified, sales are growing promisingly promisingly and uh, the distribution channels direct sale but also via traders have been opened up and we're well connected with the biochar industry and the ecosystem and we've worked out a gross pass to increase uh, both revenues and and contribution margins now that we uh, half a year ago we decided to kind of kick off the next uh, phase um, and um, bring the company to the next level of, of revenues. And uh, therefore we decided to, we had, well, we, we, we jointly decided to, to, to rebuild the team um, and look for a new CEO that, um, well, there, there are also fa always phases in, the, in, the, in, the, in a company. 
And uh, now we are in the phase where we really need to have a, um, a, a very experienced manager, which we hired, and we raised uh, a growth financing that gives us sufficiently way to, to exploit the growth potential. Now, what are, what are the, the big success factors for raising capital? And let me start with the three objectives for a startup after running through the initial setup. And the first most important point is selling. The second point is selling. And the third one is selling. It's really all about getting market traction, proving that it's possible to sell the products that you develop, that you think you have the value proposition for. And it's important to be ambitious, but one should never be unrealistic. Um, and you can also fail on certain approaches. And we failed in Kabuna definitely on certain of the approaches, but you should never bullshit your investors if you realize that one of the approaches, that's all I always talk about kind of um, experimental entrepreneurship when you're in startups, you have to try out things. And if it doesn't work, you have to stop that and have to go to different ways. And then when it comes to investors, um, it's like with the frogs. So you have to kiss a lot of frogs to, to find your prince. And, but still, and it's very, very important to carefully select the lead investor or the lead investors. And um, the, the big art of financing is actually finding the right timing to, to get in money for the gross financing. Too early is not good, too late is obviously keeps you being too long, too small. So that is the real art. And sometimes thinking out of the box can help. And I would like to show you what I mean with thinking out of the box. So we have been introduced to a salt company. Now, somebody might say, well, what does salt and biochar has to do with it? Are you considering mixing salt and biochar? No, but there's they have so many things in common because we're talking both times, we're talking about handling of bulk materials that are previously undefined. Um, and we have to, through certification, quality control, make them into real products. And on top, there's a great other synergy which is um, uh, the soil production is an energy intense production. So we're seeking now for synergies between biochar production and um, bioenergy. So that was my quick presentation of Carbona and um, the investor. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, could you just say a little bit more that, about, um, it was one of your bullet points that, that really st stood out to me. Um, we've got a growth path to increase revenue and margin, and clearly that's going to be, uh, you know, um, music to the ears of investors. Can you, can you just say a little bit more about what, what that growth path looks like? Well, as a biochar, as a European biochar industry, um, and I spoke in the previous one uh, about the growth in the solar industry, that was 36% over 35 years. In the biochar industry, we're seeing now doubling between 60 and 60% 60 and 100% uh, growth is what we expect for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So it's very obvious that we are not, um, and that is about ambition. So we're not seeking to grow 20% year over year. So very obviously we're seeking to grow at the level or above the level of the market growth. And um, let me quickly comment on, on margins. It was said previously that the agricultural business is not a high margin, high margin business. That means in order to, 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 to make a good business, we also need to have specialty products, but also volume. Okay. Grace, thank you. That's um, that's really interesting. Um, we're going to move on in the uh, in the interests of time. Hans, thanks very much. Um, and our final speaker is um, is Mike. Mike, you and I had a very interesting chat uh, while I was walking my dog on uh, Monday evening. It was fascinating to hear about your business. Um, so looking forward to hear, hearing more about it and your perspective on uh, on looking for investment for it. So over to you. We may have lost Mike. Caroline, do you know if we've still got Mike? I'm just checking. It says he is on, but I know he is calling in through a phone, which might not 
be letting him join in. Um, we might just want to move on to the Q and A, and if Mike does find an, you know, the the option to come on, then maybe we can hear from him then. Yeah. Okay. That's um, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I know Mike's been having um, uh, connectivity problems, so hopefully we can get him back. Um, just looking through some of the questions that have been um, that have been asked. There's a lot of um, technical questions, uh, which is you know entirely understandable. There's some very interesting, uh, very interesting points to be made. Yeah, uh, panelists, uh, do, do you want to come back, Brian, uh, Daniel, Hans? Thanks. Um, but uh, j just looking down the um, the questions, maybe we can come back to some of the more technical ones. There's a, a really good question from um, Albert Fisher. Albert, thanks. Um, can you tell us more about what it takes to be trusted by um, by, by leading brands? So, Hans, maybe um, may, may, maybe I could throw this this one over to you in terms of um, you know partnerships with um, with other companies. You, you talked about the uh, the salt producer. Um, what, what are you, what are your thoughts on this? What, is, what does it take to, um, to, to, to make yourself trustworthy to, um, to, to a brand like that? I mean, first it's, it's really about looking for fits and, um, what, whatever you do, um, you have your specialty and, um, joining with partners and that goes, um, within the ecosystem of the biochar industry, suppliers, um, people that, um, that that trade the, the the biochar certificates, it's always I, I'm a huge fan of specializing on something and make that really good, and therefore, um, and and this is kind of the answer to your question. I mean, you have to be really good at what you do, and then if you're good at what you do, then your customers will stay with you um, because they are happy. And if they are unhappy, they should tell you. And if if they have a problem, you have to work with them to solve the problem. And, and that is kind of the main, uh, also one of the key elements of when we look for our uh, um, uh, investor, an industrial partner, um, that was very important to him. Great, thanks. And, and Hans, sorry, just just to stick with you for a second. I mean, as I said at the start of the panel, I'm relatively new to the to the biochar world, and one of the things that fascinates me about it is the sheer range of applications of this um, of, of, of this material. I mean, it's it's really extraordinary. Um, what what are your thoughts on? Uh, and I'm I'm sort of coming to you because it, you know it feels as if you've worked across a, a pretty broad range of, um, of of applications in the sector. What what are your thoughts about um, the relative attractiveness to investors of the different applications of biochar from the sort of thing that you know Daniel's doing, um, you know very very high end, um, uh, you know materials focused um, business. Um, through to you know the more let me say the more traditional sort of soil um, soil enhancement applications of biochar and that is not in any way to uh, you know to, to denigrate anyone who's who's working in that sphere at all because I know there's you know there's a lot of expertise and, and complexity in it but it does feel as if there are different markets different investor perceptions different prices and therefore margins available uh, can you can you expand on that on that thought Hans? Yeah, I mean that makes the beauty of the biochar of the biochar industry and and the beauty of how early is that industry because it it's like um, yeah being a real entrepreneur to to look out which application can work out how and um, I mean we the, the the dominating market in Europe. Uh, the dominating market in Europe for for bulk material, I mean, for substantial volume of biochar today in uh, in Europe is animal feed, um, specialty crops, and um, structured soils in cities. And structured soils in cities mostly focused in um, in in Scandinavia. Uh, so these are the three applications that that go best. But actually, that is, I mean. That is the most fun part of the work to to evaluate um, applications, uh, talk to people you have never talked about 
before and and find out if there is a business case or not and if there is none go away go to the next one and focus mm. focus on a few ones so do spend 80 percent of your time on things you know that work and uh, spend the rest 20 percent of your time on things that might work and pull the plug when it's when 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 it turns out that it doesn't work Okay, great. Thank you. Brian, um, it would be remiss of me not to ask you the question that's got um, rather more votes than any other question in the Q&A panel, which is, what do you do with the used biocarbon after it's no longer useful as a, as a filter? I'm, I, must, I must admit the same question occurred to me when I, I saw your presentation. No. So, you know, typically today, um, whether it's activated carbon or these other materials, um, that goes to a landfill. Um, and there are some people that are starting to regenerate uh, the carbon. So there are several companies that will take activated carbon and regenerate through um, a, a run again through much quicker run through uh, uh, pyrolysis, basically to cook off any organics that are on there. I guess from our standpoint, as the carbon market starts to get bigger and bigger uh, for some of these uh, carbon credits, um, whoever ends up putting it in the landfill where it's basically going back into the soil is gonna end up with those carbon credits. Uh, ours can also be used for, uh, for soil amendment, uh, but it depends upon what's in um, the, the filter, what we filtered. I mean, if we filtered uh, chromium, then yeah, you probably don't want to put that back into the, the soil. If it's mostly organics, um, there's several applications where it's mostly organics and the metals um, are, are pretty de minimis and below what would be acceptable in that, then it can go in, into, uh, into soil. Now, again, we, we will hold on to um, in our, the, 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 the the way we bond, the ionic bonding that we do with these metals, we'll hold on to uh, those metals when it goes into a landfill or into any of these other applications. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you don't have to worry about them leaching out uh, early on. Um, uh, but, you know, there are some people that are using this uh, to capture some of the very expensive metals um, you know, people that are, are making, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the large transistor and chip companies that have uh, very high value metals that they want to capture. Um, you know, there is a, a process for us to, to wash it of those metals, do that with a, a weak acid rinse, and then they can basically mine that, um, uh, that rinse water for uh, some of these uh, these metals, precious metals. So it really depends upon what we're filtering um, and, you know, what, uh, and I think the drivers will be, where are the markets um, for some of this, uh, these, these ag products for, uh, for soil uh, uh, amendment? Because we're not seeing a lot of them today um, in, uh, in the urban environments where we're doing a lot of this, uh, uh, filtration. So, you know, you've got the other question, then you've got to move it somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you've got to be careful about the costs associated with that. So a bit of a long answer to a short question, but did that, did that answer it for you? It, it did for me. Yeah. And, and just, just from, you know, my own education, and I'm, I'm sure this is a question that has occurred to others as well. When you talk about extracting precious metals, what, what is the medium from which you're extracting them? Is, is, is this essentially, you know, um, material that's being dug out of mines with very low concentrations of um, precious metals that you're, you're then washing, yeah. or are we talking about waste recovery? Waste recovery. Okay, so gotcha. for, for people that are making uh, you know, chips today, uh, transistors, chips, you know, uh, et cetera, that are using gold um, for plating on, uh, on, on connectors and, you know, titanium and other precious metals, um, you know, that does end up in the wastewater. And if you can collect that through 
the use of our media, then you've got an opportunity to be able to, um, as we said, mine that uh, without burning it. You, you don't want to burn it uh, to, to, you know, sort of smelt it. That, that defeats the purpose of, uh, of creating, you know, this stable carbon. You want to be able to do it, um, you know, with a, a, as we do with an, a very weak acid rinse. In, in our case, we use a strong vinegar. Um, so yes. it's, it's, you know, every, everything that we do in the production of our media um, are, are stuff that you can find in your kitchen. You can eat our media, it will not kill you. So it's all very green, uh, which is a key component to, to what we're doing and a key positioning component against, um, you know, ion exchange resin beads and some of these other materials that are used today to filter dissolved metals from um, wastewater streams. Got you, got you. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. And Brian, just just sticking with you, um, I think you've you've answered um, two or three of the questions that were in the uh, in the chat. But there's a there's one here from Stephen Plotnick. Stephen, thank you um, about um, uh, application of of your business model to um, to desalination. So areas where there's you know high demand for water and and, and low supply. Is there a is there a link there? It, it's actually a great application because any any time you're doing desalinization, you're using reverse osmosis. Um, those membranes, um, you know, you you want to get the water sort of as clean as you can before it hits the membranes because those membranes are are expensive and uh, to to replace and uh, certainly time consuming uh, and metals. Um, are, are uh, one of the few materials that it's very hard to backwash. Uh, it's impossible to backwash uh, out of RO membranes. So if, if we can pull those metals out before it hits the membranes, it helps to make that RO process more efficient. Uh, and frankly, the wastewater uh, discharge a lot less toxic. Because again, we're, we're capturing and holding on to uh, those those toxic elements. So, um, you know, we don't do anything for salt. So, you know, if you want to desalinate, uh, you you got to use uh, those kinds of microfiltration, uh, nanofiltration processes. But we can make that process a lot more efficient, uh, which means less costly, and we can extend significantly the life of the membranes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Brian, thanks. Um, Daniel, turning turning to you, a um, um, couple of interesting questions for you in the chat. One of them is, um, are you able to produce enough biochar to meet the demand of your customers? So in other words, are you, you know, demand constrained or supply constrained at the moment? Um, and would you buy and blend from others to, 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 meet, to meet that demand? Yeah, I mean, no, we, we can't. We we're quickly see that perspective that we can't supply as much as uh, we see in demand. Um, but of course, we're also scaling up. So um, we're actually also kind of um, OK with that because it sort of creates a scarcity for our materials. So it's kind of a good negotiating position sometimes that we really take this uh, uh, perspective that we have a limited supply in our first plants and who wants to partner with us to do something with that. Um, we would consider partnering, but uh, I would say it's a bit early days. We're really developing still, we're still in a kind of like pilot plant stage. So we're developing the technologies for the powder processing and how we exactly are gonna work with char suppliers is still a little bit in development, but um, obviously there is that element to the scale that we're trying to achieve that we don't operate every single char plant in the world that uh, makes these materials ourselves. So that's a little bit like going forward in the in the business model thinking. Okay, thanks. And there was a there, there was a question that um, I, I think was referring to the you know really extraordinarily beautiful website that you have. Um, oh, <laughs> um, I mean, how you know I, I I work in a in a in a business where 
you know, we, we support a lot of different initiatives across a lot of different social sectors. And I've certainly been struck by the power of good marketing, not just, you know, clarity on simple, clear messages, but also just something that's very visually appealing. I mean, and it's easy to be cynical about that and say, well, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about the market. It should be about the, you know, the, the ROI and all the rest of it. But how, how important have you found this? I, I, I don't, I don't mean to use the word pejoratively when I say slick marketing, but you know, visually stylish and impressive marketing. How how important have you have you really found that to be? Well, for us, it's been very important because we um, we really took this approach that we want to be a brand alongside the big brands. So um, there's a little bit of an element that the people we talk to first are marketing people. So you're just sort of speaking their language by um, yeah, crafting your visual language, your messaging. Uh, but then it's also like, um, I think, creating the prospect that we can, that our, our way of talking about this um, topic can be appealing to their end consumers. Um, I don't know, like we're in terms of role models, we, we really look a lot at Gore, Gore and Company, like this brand and brand approach, or Parlay for the Oceans, like this company that's recuperating ocean plastics and making jeans out of it, and recently was bought by Adidas actually, so it's no longer really a brand and brand. Um, and the reason being is that the, the, the topic of carbon removal is so complex. I mean, we normally, when we talk to people, we always know the first time we talk to them, they didn't get it. We always kind of sit around and we wait for three days for a week. And then we hope that we get this email where they realize what we're talking about. And then they come around and they're like, okay, this is really interesting. And you can't really do that with your customers. So if you think about this like consumer level, and I think we need the consumers to change the big brands because they're normally operating highly efficient businesses and they won't change anything until customers ask them to. Um, we're, we're just trying to use the branding as a way to speak to, to those customers simultaneously as we're speaking to the to the OEMs, and then hopefully they meet and they they see that that benefit that uh, we provide the solution and um, a kind of shortcut way of talking about it. So that right. made of air as a brand becomes associated with carbon negative materials. I have to just come back to one point here um, because because Daniel made a really great point. Uh, now he's talking about customers, but you know, as this is about investors, I just have to say, ninety nine point nine percent of the conversations that we've had with investors, they had not a clue what we were talking about, and <laughs> it, it's it's very new, and this process is. Um, you know, there's a bit of alchemy here, and um, and and so a lot of these investors really aren't understanding. You know, they, they don't understand the process of creating a biochar or biocarbon as we produce it, and nor do they understand really the whole you know carbon cycle and how this addresses climate change. So you know what what we find is we have to say it and and say it and <laughs> say it again. You know, and which is the old advertising uh, mantra that you got to say it three times before anybody really understands what your message is. And, you know, we're finding that certainly in the investor community, that there are some people starting to get up to that, you know, on that learning curve. But initially, it's it's really hard. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm an advisor to a company that's uh, working on a technology that will uh, accelerate the oxidation of methane um in the atmosphere um so methane removal uh, you try explaining that to people for the first time it's, uh, i know i know i know exactly what you mean but you know this point about um brian that you raise about investors becoming more sophisticated my my day job is working in um in natural climate solutions most of the time and you, we are certainly finding as we sell um red plus credits to um to large corporations that, that they're on a, a spectrum of sophistication as, as buyers and i can easily believe the same is true of um 
um, of, of investors. Hands, you know, a point that you made um, early on. In fact, no, Brian, it was you actually. That's uh, yeah. That the, this point, there's you know, the strong interest in in climate technology and in and in ESG. So you know, it does feel as if you know perhaps investors are starting to get a little more sophisticated. Hans, has that has that been your experience? Do you see more and more investors getting up that learning curve? Definitely. And and if I compare, I mean, I'm I'm in the biotech as an investor and um, um, uh, since 2017. And at that time, 2018, 20, not, even, not even hardcore environmentalists didn't know about uh, negative emissions. And that has improved a lot. So there's still a lot of work to do. And I love what you say, Brian, that we have to, to say it over and over again. So we have to continue saying, Biochar is the most important negative emission technology for the next 15 to 20, maybe 25 years. And if you continue saying that, that'll work. And we have to grow at at least 80%, even better, more. And we can clearly see that um, investors have changed their mindset and they want to see um, good I mean, really good contributions um, on um, on CO2, but the industry is only starting to to learn and, and to learn that the investors are about to get it. But I had the same experience like Daniel and Brian that very often they they don't understand it at the first time sometimes mm. often enough not not at the third time okay yeah. and, interesting and that Thank also you. Gets back to the customer perspective as well because we you know for for daniel and i we, we're we're not selling a product to a farmer we're selling a product to um an, an, you know different industries mm. and the water industry is very risk averse because if you get it wrong as they did in flint People get sick and people yeah. die. So um, you know they're very, very risk averse. But what's really driving that is we're starting to see in these big companies that are our customers, not municipalities, but you know the Toyotas of the world out there that have plants and they paint and plate things and they need to pull metals out of that wastewater. That chief sustainability officers in these big companies you know, Audi, you know, man, car manufacturers, et cetera, are saying, well, we, we really need to look at some of these new materials because there's an opportunity for us, certainly in our case, uh, and, and in, in other materials like what, what uh, Made of Air is doing, not, not only are you more sustainable, but in a lot of cases, you're less expensive than what's on the market today. Mm. And, and now you have an economic incentive to make that shift and little or no behavioral shifts required, no, no, you know, switching costs associated. And if you can mm. get those things to happen, that's when you see that inflection curve really start to spring up, which is, you know, again, what happened going back to the solar industry we're talking about, you know, in, in the past, in the last conversation is once you get to parity or below parity where you're less expensive, that's when you really see, you know, that, that acceleration start to be logarithmic. And we're not there yet, but um, you know, with a lot of a lot of these technologies. But you know, what's exciting about where we are is we are there, and and we're hoping to get that, you know, uh, that inflection curve starting to really shoot up. Well, Brian, thanks, and I think that's a, a very positive and encouraging note um, to close on because uh, we're at time now. So, Hans, uh, Daniel, Brian, thank you. This has been a really, really interesting conversation, and I uh, only wish that we could keep it going longer. So, thank you, and uh, Kathleen, back to you. Yeah, and thank you, John. Thanks. That was very well done, all of you. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to hear all those messages because they certainly resonate with me and what I hear from investors. And, and so, thank you. Uh, next up, everybody, we have the the chart tank video presentations. So Caroline will be queuing them up. And our first one comes from one of our silver sponsors. Uh, Brian, I think you have to turn off your camera. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it comes from Vow, it's, which is a company that uh, was created through a merger with a Norwegian company. Scanship and a French company that produced technology to make biochar Etia. So, Caroline, do we have that one ready to go yet?
That was great. That's the kind of advertising I like to see in the biochar world. Uh, next up is is uh, New Earth, which I mistakenly said was from Brazil yesterday. They are a company based in Montreal, and they are not only looking for people to sell their carbon credits on their platform, but they are also looking for investors. So they submitted a video for today as well. So Caroline, over to you. Okay, and next up we have a video from Biomass Controls. It's probably one of the biochar production technologies I'm personally most familiar with as we have one at a local university where I do research and we're looking to put one on a dairy farm in New York State. So Caroline, I'll let you cue that one up. Uh-oh, says unavailable. Just play the next one for right now. Okay, we'll skip that one and go to the one from Brazil, a company called Neochar, which I had not heard of. Um, and I mistakenly said they were playing yesterday, but it's quite an interesting proposition here. Hey. Um, and then Kathleen and I, I can share a biomass controls video here. We're just going to um, do this. The thing we did yesterday, sharing through my screen, and I'll keep my microphone on this. Okay. This is the biomass controls char tank presentation for the 2021 business of biochar virtual event. Our big idea was to produce a refinery to make biochar from feedstocks that you could get paid a tipping fee to process. We identified the environmental and economic benefits from the decentralized approach. An important benefit included diversion from landfills, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and volume reduction. We also recognized that in addition to the biochar, we could increase our revenue from licensing, remote data management, and reporting. Our buyers are the operators who make money by collecting tipping fees or save on transportation costs for the processing of high moisture organic waste. The reports provide important evidence of our system operation. We have licensed manufacturers in the US, India, and Africa. They also have the ability to sell directly. We supply the control systems and collect a royalty and license fee from each unit sold. We work with many partners to improve our control software and deliver a distributed solution that uses a continuous process to produce biochar. Our system is unique due to our patented controls technology that allow us to optimize the process for different feedstocks in different climates while reducing air emissions. Common feedstocks for our refinery include human waste, separated dairy manure, food waste, and textiles. Each system can process one to two tons of feedstock per day. Our refineries fit in a seven foot by seven foot cube. We've currently been awarded 21 patents in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia. Biomass Controls focuses on a decentralized processing of organic material that is high in moisture and is traditionally dumped in a landfill or body of water. Co-products that can be valorized from our system include thermal energy, which we can use for drying feedstocks or pasteurizing water. We've also demonstrated our system producing electricity with organic rankin cycle technology, which we've been awarded several patents. Our team is very senior with a lot of experience in startups, technology, and renewables. The estimated market for our system is over 1 million units by 2035. We are raising 3 to 4 million and will use it to scale and to valorize our carbon credits. Please email me at jeff at biomasscontrols.com for more information or connect with me on LinkedIn. All right, there we have it. So we hope we will be getting more of those types of videos and figuring out between USBI and IBI how to host that type of videos to help connect those seeking investments with those seeking to invest. So with that, I think I'm going to invite Tom Miles back up onto the stage so we can do a little bit of a wrap up. Tom, we also wanted to maybe save a little bit of time at the end of this because we did receive a uh, video from our colleague Heilong Wai in no <laughs> Wang, sorry Heilong Wang from China, uh, who had a commercially oriented video. So if we have some time at the end, or if you can stay on a little bit longer, that would be great. It's about ten minutes long, if I recall. 
So Tom, any thoughts over the last three days? I know you've been uh, sitting at the uh, USBI booth and getting a lot of feedback. What are, what are people saying? Well, I think, uh, I guess my my thought or impression is that this, this uh, three days has been fantastic. And I, I really appreciate uh, the contributions and participation from the, the presenters and the participants. Those of you have, have uh, I, I think what we've seen is not only this sort of summary and and uh, uh, bringing up to date of where we are with research and and production markets and finance and so on, uh, but I think we've identified a lot of new new challenges, uh, but I and and opportunities. I think we've identified some important pathways that we need to pursue to uh, uh, to inform people about biochar. Uh, you know, I like. Uh, Hans Jörg's statement that uh, you know biochar is the most important uh, negative emissions technology for the next 20 years, and we need to grow at 80%. You know that's a, that's a great kind of a vision and challenge, and and the need to clearly identify uh, the value proposition for, for biochar so we can uh, hopefully recoup the the costs of doing the good work that we've all been doing. There's been a, a there there been a question, sort of an unanswered question I had suggested earlier that. Uh, that our infrastructure bill in the United States is promoting or, or supporting biochar. And just a quick answer to that, there's $200 million allocated in the infrastructure bill to the U.S. Department of Agriculture gets half of it and the U.S. Department of Interior and the other half uh, for the purpose of converting forest residues um, to ultimately to biochar. So we'll see how that gets distributed through the different agencies, uh, basically building up uh, kind of government support uh, another thing that we have seen, some of the comments we've heard in some of the individual chat is the need for educating our government people about biochar uh, so that they can provide our agricultural extension people, our forestry people, uh, and others uh, about the value of biochar and how it can be used. So, I'm, you know, we, it, we come away from these uh, gatherings uh, inspired and and i think i'm i'm in, encouraged and inspired and and i think i have a little bit better understanding and of uh of where uh many of you uh in the biochar community are coming from and some pathways forward that we can deploy both the through international biochar initiative and through the u.s biochar initiative so many thanks uh kathleen and caroline and and uh for organizing the event uh i think we've got a great path forward Agreed. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was so much more we could have covered. And there were a lot of technical questions that we, we didn't quite get to in the Q&A. So for those of you that had those questions, I think maybe if you just drop IBI or USBI a note saying, hey, I'd like a little bit deeper conversation. We knew this platform didn't really lend itself to having uh, too many multiple congruent uh, discussions going on. So we only gave people, you know, a very brief time to introduce themselves and share a little bit of their knowledge. So through things like the IBI webinars, we can dig a lot deeper and provide more of that technical side of things. Um, one thing I want to say, and Tom, I know you know this as well as I do, but, you know, there were some numbers shared on day one about where the current production is. And it's, pretty small. But that said, I, I think Tom and I talked to a lot of people in the U.S. and elsewhere that are in the process of getting permitted for a lot of biochar. So I think we need to be ready. We need to be really working on developing those markets. Um, but it is one of those things that even those that are already trading on the carbon markets are saying, you know, help. <laughs> so, uh, Tom, anything you want to say on the, on the market side? No, I, I one of the, the interesting things I think that's come out, especially in today's discussion, is the focus on products and markets. And what I see a lot, uh, I, I get probably five to six calls a week uh, from uh, people interested in, in biochar production and so on. And typically our weak point, uh, I think a number of our speakers hit on today, and that is, uh, the product definition and distribution, the whole sort of productization, what what product are you making and how are you going to distribute it? How do you get shelf space in the marketplace and, and, and how big is that market? Those are areas where I think more of our uh, uh, biochar entrepreneurs need to, to kind of focus and, and, and messaging. And to the degree that organizations like uh, USBI or the European 
uh, Australian, other regional organizations, and IBI can help with that definition and, and messaging. Uh, we need your good ideas and your contribution. You know, we're largely volunteer organizations, and and uh, we're we are a, we are a people always comment that we're a very passionate community in the biochar community. Uh, but let's uh, help each other out and, and clarify that marketing message. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and heretofore, it has been largely volunteer, but again, through the WOCA Foundation and some other funds through the U.S. Forest Service, we've been able to to do a lot more than we have been in the past. So those funds are definitely appreciated. One other uh, question that came up uh, several times was about standards. Uh, and, and this has been kind of a hot topic between IBI and uh, the, the voluntary markets. And I will say that one of the things the funding did was allow us to have a, uh, an external consultant, uh, Keo Enders, come in and do a deep dive uh, into our standards, which haven't been updated in, I don't know how many years, six, seven, Tom, keep me honest there. Uh, but we are in the process of looking not only at how to align with uh, some of the, the uh, elements of the European standard, we obviously have to follow US legislative dictates or uh, regulations on soil-based um, additives, but we're looking at that. We're also looking at expanding it beyond North America, uh, and we're also looking at expanding it to include standards beyond just use in soils, because there's a huge amount of interest in putting it in things like composites and concrete and asphalt. Uh, so one of our board members, in fact, Han Waipua from Singapore, has been drafting some some standards for the use of biochar in concrete. So hopefully next year we'll see some progress on that. Anything? Oh, and Tom, I know you're working with one of the standards boards on the development of, uh, um, it's not an ASTM standard. Who's the standards no, it's body? The international, international Standards Organization. So as was mentioned earlier, I think Sampo mentioned the, uh, the use of, of biochar and incorporation of carbon in steel. Uh, and I think he put a couple of years uh, uh, looking at, at some sort of development justification of uh, uh, using biochar in, in, in steel. There's been a strong push to use biocarbon uh, as a renewable uh, energy source replacement for petroleum coke in steel. And uh, that drove the International Standards Organization. There's a committee on uh, solid biofuels that actually developed an international standard, an ISO standard 238 on, um, on solid biofuels, particularly for the international trade in, in wood pellets. Um, but that committee now has a subcommittee that we are participating in, uh, led by uh, the Canadian uh, delegations from FPN of Innovations and CanMet Canada on developing a biocarbon and biochar standard uh, through ISO. That will take a few years, uh, and a lot of it will be defining, you know, what that standard means. Uh, one of the things that's, I think, very important is that we have so much variability. A lot of people may not realize that for soils, IBI actually has a tool on the IBI website to help match your particular biochar with suggested applications in soils, and really matching the characterization characteristics of a product to its end use is, I think, more important than particular standards that may set levels. You know, the, the objective of IBI standards is to develop biochars that are safe, stable, and sustainable. And I think we need to continue those goals, but still be open to a variety of product qualities, but match those product qualities to the end use. So that's kind of what we're on about. Uh, looking at standards, our board member, David Wayne, has often commented that the, uh, a lot of the IBI standard has to do with toxicology, and that's really the safety side, uh, uh, whether it's for feed or soil uh, applications. So that's kind of the direction I think we're, we're headed. Exactly. Uh, I wanted to spend just a couple more minutes on the Conference of the Parties last month in Glasgow and some of the my takeaways where biochar could really uh, help negotiators to increase ambitions. And the one area that was a huge focus at COP was methane mitigation. And to reiterate, I mean, we know that biochar can help reduce methane in, in many different ways, but if 
if you're in the biochar space and you um, haven't looked at this already, I think this is something that's going to resonate a lot with governments, especially maybe not with end buyers, but if we can make the argument of how much methane mitigation biochar could impact uh, and you could get that message to your state or county or uh, federal negotiators uh, or EPAs. I think that's something we really need to focus on for 2022. Same thing with adaptation was a very big theme there because as much as we want to sequester carbon and rebalance atmospheric carbon, there's there's a lot going on already with climate change in terms of flooding and disaster recovery. And there are so many ways that biochar can play into um, adaptation that I think we ought to start playing up that theme a lot more than we have in the past. Uh, to some, that's an acknowledgement that, you know, it, it, there's nothing else we can do. But in my opinion, we need to parallel process here on the mitigation side and the reduction side. And then the last thing I would say is uh, the United Nations is always focused on multiple things at once. So it's not just about climate change, although I will agree with panelists that this is the topic of our time, uh, but they have the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as I mentioned in my welcome speech, I think biochar and biochar production plays well in terms of mitigating many of those sustainable development goals. So depending on who you're speaking to and if those resonate, I think that's also a topic we need to hone and, and, and deliver better messaging for. So those were just a couple more thoughts I, I wanted to put out there. And also one thing is everybody keeps asking, how do we raise the profile of biochar at COP? And for those of you that haven't been to COP, there's, there's three distinct areas. One is the negotiators where the, the national folks are behind closed doors and most people that are there as observers can never get into those. So we don't really hear the nitty gritty of what's going on, but then the other thing part is what's called the blue zone. And mostly that's a lot of uh, national or regional booths that have presentations for the full two weeks. And then there's the green zone, which is a lot about what the local folks are doing and, and anybody can go to that. But I would think that one of the best pathways to get biochar's profile elevated is to get some of the national and regional uh, pavilions to start talking about biochar. And I don't think that's as hard to do as we might think it is. We did have one pavilion, Cameroon, believe it or not, that was announcing a, a um, industrial scale biolysis unit there that's carbonizing coffee waste. So I think if we make a concerted effort for all of those out there that can speak to you know, the Better Business Bureau, the EPA, anybody that might have the ability to influence what gets talked about at the pavilions uh, would be great. And in the past, they've also had booths available for some of the observers. They didn't really do much of that this year. So IBI did not have the opportunity to do that. Uh, we're hoping uh, post COVID that we might have more opportunities like that. But Again, those are just a couple of thoughts on where I think we could improve our presence and the biochar conversation at COP. All right, Tom, any last thoughts? We may actually be able to squeeze Heilong's video in here. Well, let's let's get Heilong's video in. I guess my last thought again, uh, thank you all for participating and a special thanks to our sponsors for uh, helping us put on the event. Indeed, yes. And Rob, I don't know if you're up on stage yet, but if you wanted to say uh, uh, any final quick thoughts. I would. <clears throat> I'll say three quick things. Uh, one, uh, this has been an excellent conference. I've been watching the comments in the chat and very positive uh, reviews coming in. Uh, I want to first recognize the two of you, Kathleen and Tom, who really were the brains behind it and the hands that did almost all the work. Uh, so I think it's a good uh, example of what I talked about at first is, you know, this being volunteer run, but producing at a really excellent level of output. So the second thing I want to say is thank you to our support team at TTC, which is Caroline, who many of you have been seeing. Um, she brought, uh, she is the event coordinator 
uh, brought us this platform that we're using, which I think has been great. Uh, the networking, the uh, presentations and all have gone very well. Uh, and she's brought us a systematic approach to planning the conference uh, and getting the marketing materials out. Uh, and with over 400 uh, registered participants, uh, you know, that speaks for itself in terms of the success. I do want to recognize a behind the scenes contributor, and that is uh, Brian Shore. Brian uh, does an awful lot of work uh, for uh, the International Biochar Initiative uh, on TTC staff, and he's been um, working the computers the whole time uh, these sessions have been going on and dealing with uh, problems as they've come up, but he's also been keeping us on track uh, throughout the months of planning and putting this whole thing together. So thank you, Brian, as well. The final uh, comment I want to make is a thank you to the more than 400 people who have registered and participated in the conference. Uh, your, your contributions have been terrific. I've learned uh, more than I ever expected to. Uh, and I just want to say uh, that hopefully this is the first step in uh, elevating our game, uh, getting biochar known in the world, uh, both at the policy level and with the general public. So thank everyone for your contributions. Yeah, and thank you, Rob. And Caroline, most especially. All right, so Caroline, do you have uh, Hey Long's video lined up to go? And then uh, don't don't leave after that. We do have another hour of networking after that. So you're welcome Hi, to. Everyone. This is uh, Hey Long. Ready to play it now. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off there, Kathleen. We lost him, Caroline. You probably know that. All right, that's it for our presentations for um, the symposium. Like I said in the chat, we are now going to move back to the networking floor and the networking floor will be open for the next hour. Please, if you have any contact information in the chats, make sure that you jot it down because it will not be accessible after today's event. Um, and so you have until 3.30 Eastern time uh, to continue networking. We'll hope to see you on the networking floor. Thanks all. Thanks for joining.